Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, and listeners, and especially those that tune in every Saturday. Um, had a little bit of feedback about uh, our dog episodes last week. And as always, I'd like to welcome Steve Dixon, friend, colleague, and um, the top man at Skylight Aviation. <laughs> Good morning, Chris. That's Good morning. Generous of you. No, ah, well, one, I, I, one, I feel I have one, to. One, once upon a time, I was the only man at Skylight Aviation, but um, we, we seem to have managed to solve that in the last few years. Yeah, 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 no, but things are going well. Fair play to you. Now, the other thing I was going to mention, and while we're on the topic of dogs, I think I remember a long time ago saying, what sort of breed would you be? And I'm sure you said a Border Collie because it was the most intelligent breed of a dog. And as <laughs> such, you've now bought one and you've got one. So you're a now owner of one of the most intelligent breeds in the world. I as I said to you earlier, I'm not sure whether that's so that you can challenge him or learn from him. Indeed, indeed. Neither, neither am I. But look, the, the, reality, the reality, I guess, is that, um, that I'd gone from owning a Dalmatian historically and previously. In fact, she's, she's, just, she's just popped into my feet. I'm not sure if that was fortuitous timing um, or otherwise, but she just, she just walked, back in, walked back in the room. So, yeah, um, a new addition to the family. She's, uh, she's 12 weeks old, so we're very happy to have her here. Um, I'll just pop her at my feet, but I'll apologise to our listeners in advance if there's any yelps or noises that um, would normally not, not, be, not be heard. But hey, we're live in a... No, it's OK, month. Steve. I've heard you yelp before, mate, so don't worry. <laughs> That's when I have to pay the bar bill, Chris. Uh, uh, and we know different. Right. <laughs> moving on. Moving, moving swiftly on. on. Yeah, moving swiftly on. Now, again, keeping things positive. Lots of positives this week. Also, a few, a few things that, um, as we say, who on earth has kidnapped common sense and logic? You know, a few, a few um, usual suspects have popped up again. But from a confidence booster, one of the things that I've seen in, in Terminal 5 was the, um, the robot. I don't know yes, if you've seen yes. it, have you? Have you seen the I robot? Haven't. No, no, I haven't. No. What does what the said robot do? It, it's, it, 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 um, uh, it's, got, it's got rays. Okay, that, that, that um, clean everything. It's amazing. It goes into the toilets, goes around right. the terminal. Ultraviolet rays. I think I, I've seen some of these in Japan, I think, historically. They've had these Japanese robots in Japan clean the terminals, but, but not, 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 we're not with a UV. So I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the point. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I, people, might, I, might need, I might need a UV robot, depending on how my dog does here. Yeah, it may be. No, but people are doing a lot of things now to instill confidence. Oh, I know you want to talk about the 12-minute um, COVID test. Well, I guess, you know, there's, I, there's been a, a, um, you know, a number of, of, sort of false starts, I guess, a bit like I've had there trying to get my sentence out. Um, but in trying to restore confidence um, uh, whilst meeting government regulations, and you know it's clear that, that some airlines have been choosing to test off their own backs uh, i guess to protect themselves their crew and yeah. their own passengers other governments have mandated tests some of those tests have been prior to departure some have been prior to That's arrival or sorry you know upon arrival and destination and indeed the some onerous tests um, have been on uh, you know prior to departure i.e before being accepted by the airline and upon arrival in the lounge, even if you have had the test within 72 hours or whatever the, the, the previous state it was. So I think, um, you know, testing is becoming a problem. I was reading that, that um, you know, to call it Italy for a bit of praise because it, 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 Italy came under a lot of flack and, and, you know, and fire at the beginning of this crisis because they were, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the hot pot in Europe, um, you know, immediately after China exploded. I say China exploded. I mean, China exploded with coronavirus. China didn't disappear. China is still still very much present. Um, we won't we won't um, go there. But the but the I I I I'm I'm a xenophile, so we could go there. I'm a big fan of China. That's for another another topic another day probably. Um, but Chris, the, the 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 point of testing is for a lot of people, it's difficult to get these tests done either in their in their sort of home areas or within the you know within an yeah, hour of yeah. their of their houses whatever. And actually, reading within Italy. Yeah, there's only there's only three or four test centers in the whole country that actually are doing these COVID tests, which I found it astounding. Um, so I was, um, you know, in, in, in reading reading the news the news earlier this week, I, I, I caught up on a, um, a trial that um, 
that uh, you know is launched in Italy, where I guess the Italian, I think it was the just the, no, just the Italian authorities, but in the um, in Rome, um, I have provided a twelve minute test. So um, and they're testing the accuracy of that. I mean, so they're validating the accuracy of that test now. But it seems to be getting a, a pretty good write up. And I guess what that does is says, look. We understand that getting testing for some people is difficult. In some countries, if you don't have symptoms, you cannot get tested. In some countries, if you're not a key worker, you cannot get tested. And in other countries, it's prohibitively bloody expensive yeah. to get tested. I mean, some, yeah. I mean, private tests in the UK cost upwards of 300 quid if you're not yep. entitled to test on the NHS. So I think what Italy is trying to do is saying, look, a 12-minute COVID-19 test that has only shown so far during the trials two false results and it costs under 15 euros it's currently being trialed. It's made by a South Korean company called SD, no relation of mine, SD Biosensor. Um, and they've, they've tested on a thousand people already. So but that's a little bit of positive news. I think a lot of these tests will, you know, the requirements will still change as we go forward. But, but hey, we should call out some, some of this, this stuff. And yeah. I think that, you know, we, we, we maybe discounted the continued need for tests as early at the outset. But now I think we're, we're, it's clear that confidence isn't getting this there as early as we want it to be. And they'll continue for some time. Yeah, and another positive bit of news, I think when leaders realise they should have learnt something or maybe they made mistakes, the timing of when they announce that they could have done things better yeah. is very, very, very risky. But old Boris seems to have uh, agreed that things could have been done differently at the beginning, which fair play to him. But now's the chance and now's the time to start showing what the lessons were. And I think if that starts to get communicated, that will do an awful lot of good as well. And the reason I'm saying that is because these air bridges, or we should maybe call them wobbly bridges now, because the principle made sense. Yeah. But now that things are potentially changing whilst people are on vacation, it could cause an awful lot of embarrassment and uh, and and problems for families. And well, I think the so first thing is the the I don't think Boris quite gave a mea culpa. Um, it wasn't quite to that extent, but I think what he did do is welcome an investigation into some of the challenges that they've had and accept that decisions weren't made as quickly as they could have been. Um, that, of course, challenges his premiership and his leadership. So I think for him to do that was, was actually pretty, pretty selfless. Um, and, um, you know, he should take it, um, he's, you know, taking full responsibility, which politicians don't generally want to do. Second thing is, um, you know, these air bridges were heralded as being sort of the saviour to allow us to go on holiday this summer. Um, and it's very clear now that the Airbridge concept, while sound, um, the goalposts have changed. Funny that, you know, yeah. um, um, you get halfway down, halfway down the track and the goalposts change. So what, what it now means is that the, instead of a three-weekly or three-week review of which countries make the no quarantine list, it's now on a rolling basis. So you could foreseeably book your holiday in September, you know, travel at the first week in September, but, but you know, by the time you're on day eight and you're planning to return on day 14, you've got to do two weeks quarantine when you get home. Well, as the, as the economy reopens and as businesses expect that employees, yep. some businesses might not, but many businesses do, expect that employees to be back in the office, this is going to be a problem now with two weeks quarantine. So I'm, um, I'm a little bit... Uh, a little bit sort of disappointed the way that's playing out. But look, the reality is that there's, that there's still no logic to which country makes that damn list anyway. So until, until that's refined, until that's published, you know, I, I, think, I think I'd be very cautious for people on leisure travel that, that don't accept the consequences of travel at this stage, whether it's on an insurance basis or it's the risk profile. If you think, you, you, know, or, you know, I saw some discussion this week, people said, yeah, I'm not really keen on wearing a mask if I go out, walk out in yeah. public in Spain. I said, well, don't bloody go then. Yeah. No mask, no travel. It's quite simple. If you cannot comply, then don't go. If you can sit on the seat in the aircraft and mind your own business and sit there quietly for two hours and wear a mask, you'll be more than welcome to travel. But if you start, if you start this process now before you even get out the front door of your house, I think you're one of the people that should probably be staying at home. No, exactly, Steve. And, it, and it's, that, it's that directness that's missing at the moment. I mean, look at what, uh, Wear a Mask Friday kicked in yesterday. Look how many people didn't have it on. This is ridiculous. I mean, look, it's not, we said this last week, it's not much of a hardship 
to ask people to wear a mask. And these people that talk about their civil liberties, and this is against my, you know, you're taking my liberties from me by enforcing me wear a mask, and, and they're actually making a stand about it, you know, um, buoyed up by this, um, by this sort of, um, you know, uh, defiance of the system. I think that's utterly ridiculous. It shows you in a very bad light and shows you to be very, very naive and stupid, actually. Well, no wonder that the American government, um, you know, American legislators are considering having to keep middle seats empty because, oh, yes. because, because a lot of those, those, those people in that, uh, in that country, I know a lot, of, a lot of Americans and they will comply, but many of them seem to be excited by the prospect of defying law and order and defying wearing a mask. So if, 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 if the only way is to legislate, um, you know, middle seats being applied, then that's going to hurt our industry even more. So there'll yeah. be less frequency, less choice for your travel destination, less ability for you to fly from your local airport because the sector simply won't exist because they're not commercially viable. So shut up, wear a mask and get on with it. And there you have the party political broadcast from Mr. Dixon. But Steve, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well said, my friend. I, I don't well think said. it's difficult, Chris. I, I, it's I'm not. It's not, Steve. The reality it's not. is that's it. It's yeah. not. And, and like I said, we spoke about common sense. It's not common. And as soon as you give people too many options, it goes all over the place. And it's yeah. far better just to be specific. Yeah. If you want to do something, do it according to the rules. If you don't want to follow the rules, then don't do it. Exactly. Yeah. Now, just again, just to mention uh, a friend and colleague of ours, Mr. Ambridge. So I'm hoping he's going to be listening because he'll <laughs> love this, this acronym you now coming up, which originates in the state. So it's the MIDDLE Act, which stands for Maintaining Important Distance during lengthy epidemics. So it's uh, the act of 2020. So Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley is hoping to bring this in, which supports exactly what you said, keeping the middle seat free and making masks mandatory. So again, yeah. a little bit of sense as far as the masks are concerned, not sure about the middle seat. Look, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like, as you well know, I don't like government in, interfering too much in business, but, but legislators, uh, should legislate uh, as a last option. Um, the problem we've got is at the same time as legislate to keep middle seats free, you know, customers are expecting low fares to appear in market. We've got politicians in some countries complaining that average fares have increased by 60% since pre, pre COVID. Um, well, let me, let me be straight with you guys. You can't have it both ways. You can't legislate to have 30% of your capacity uh, artificially constrained on an aircraft and expect pricing to remain the same. You can't expect air routes to remain open when you are making commercial business not viable. So, so we have to have a, a sensible approach. And I support IATA's position that we've spoken about before, which is wear a mask on the aircraft. There is no need to physically distance on the aircraft. Um, uh, I, I don't like social distancing. I think we can still be social at a distance. So that, that term is, is, is null and void now, I think. But physically distant, I think, which is what that senator in Oregon is, is also suggesting. Um, you know, it doesn't work on aircraft, doesn't the, our business, our business falls apart. So yep. um, at the same time, we are losing the sub, we're losing the, the, um, the, sort of the government sponsored, the government supported uh, uh, job retention schemes, uh, the job keepers, um, you know, the payroll support scheme. I can't remember what the name was exactly in the US, but, but the equivalent, um, you know, so as we're taking all of that support away, we're trying to put more legislation on the top. All that does is further suppress our ability to recover, and actually, yep. what we we'll get is a, is a slower recovery. So, look, it's a bit of an ongoing, real, on goal, really. Um, you know, I think I think we should allow the customers to make their own decisions and those to comply. I think airlines should be able to enforce it, enforce use of masks. And if and if the customer is not willing to conform, either in the airport environment or on board the aircraft, they should be hauled off and um, and banned from travel. Yeah, I like that one, banned from travel. That we had a question from, from Andy, which was, why are the US mandating empty middle seats? Which I think you've covered, you've covered, <laughs> uh, you've covered very, yeah. very well there. But taking the empty seats and taking a similar, a similar scenario, you had Andrew Lloyd Webber, who was campaigning for, you know, opening up theatres and, and uh, you know, letting people perform again and letting people get out and see it. And his argument was that if you don't need to have middle seats empty in aircraft, why do you need to have you know, um, social distancing in theatres, if the masks are I, worn. Well, I, I completely agree with Lord Lloyd Webber. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't ever thought that we would be seeing that on this show. Uh, I don't think that a, a reference would come up to, 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 to bring in such a genius as Lord Lloyd Webber and our show, but, 
but there is one. Um, look, I think his lordship is absolutely spot on, Chris, because um, if, if you also look at all these, these um, sort of naysayers and these righteous buggers who, uh, who were you know, pointing at all the people sitting on the beach, um, uh, no, you're laughing, Chris, but, but it's true. Everybody no, I'm laughing. Stephen, I'm laughing. Listen, 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 let me just clear this up. I'm laughing because I've been waiting so long for people to start talking straight. I've never, been, I've never been somebody to mix my words, and I'm loving it, my friend. If I was Everyone's there, <laughs> if I was there, I'd give you a lick on the cheek like your colleague. I'm loving it, son. And I wouldn't make a mess. Oh, maybe I would make a mess on the floor. I'm not sure. All, all I would ask from you is a hebiki, please. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you've got one. <laughs> Next time I see you, mate. Chris, my point, everybody seems to become a policeman now. It yes. seems to be, it seems to be de rigueur to point at everyone else's failures. Or he's not wearing a mask, or she's not wearing a mask, or she's not, so she, or you're 10 centimeters too close to me. Yeah. Um, look, this is unhelpful. This is not helping, helping anybody's case. Um, the example I was going to use there in, in regards to distancing was, um, you know, the folks that, that, that went to the beach or went to the pub and got chastised massively by the press, of course. The press, of course, are selling newspapers like hotcakes yeah, on, a, yeah. on a Saturday afternoon at a Tottenham Arsenal game. Um, so, you know, they were, they were, you know, really kind of um, saying, that, you know, wait for, the, wait for this massive wave in two or three weeks' time and we'll see this massive spike. Have we seen this spike? I'm not sure we have seen the spike. I think the I think the numbers were lower than ten and ten and uh, uh, I think it was at one point one point four and a thousand increased probably around that form of three genome testing to about three and a thousand. In Leicester, it's gone back into lockdown. For example, it's seventy and a thousand. So there has been no spike from that. So whilst you know images showed people maybe being a little bit closer than drive, you know people were people were generally sensible, and I think that's why. That's why in a constrained, closed air environment, so open yeah. air beach, obviously less, less risk, closed environment, aircraft theatre, I think wearing a mask is helpful, um, being kind and considerate um, and not slapping all your, all your germs all over the place is probably helpful also. But wear your mask, just, just, just control. And the quicker you people start doing that, the quicker we get out of this mess and get back to business. Yeah, I mentioned in the media, the media should start focusing on all those positives. Uh, uh, good news doesn't sell doesn't sell newspapers. I don't think, Chris. I think bad news tends to be a better better story angle. You know, it does, but it's wrong, Steve. And and good news makes you feel better, even if it, even, could, even if it's think, even if it's tough direct talking. Good news, it makes you feel. I better. think we could all do with it. We could all do with a bit of that. What's the time here now? It's just after nine o'clock here, and you have made me feel better already. And it's four twenty in the afternoon here, and I'm going to light my barbecue in about half an hour. And, um, and I've got friends coming over and we're, we, you know, in Malaysia, we've started to get back to a semblance of normality because people are wearing masks when they go out. So yeah. I can have people back to my house. I can have my family members here. I can go and see my friends. I can have dinner restaurants. Here, this little, this little, little pink sticker here was what I, what I had on, put on my arm earlier when I went into, into a, um, the car service um, center when they, they tagged me and I scanned on my phone to confirm that, the, that I've entered the property. Is that a big deal? Am I yeah. worried about civil liberties being, 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 uh, you know, sort of diluted because of that? No, I'm not. I'm happy to happy to comply because I can go about my life with a degree of normality. Yes, I'm there with you. Right now, moving on, <laughs> moving on. Another another interesting uh, little bit of news: Emirates offering the COVID nineteen medical cover to all customers. Big news. Hey, what? my goodness me! I wonder a, who that a under bit of a boost are. Up. Yeah, and the small print would be interesting to read. I, do, I think this is, I, I mean, this is, um, this is obviously sponsored by the government of the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. Um, I think Dubai, I'm not sure Abu Dhabi, but certainly Dubai uh, um, was one of the first, um, you know, international destinations to open up, to re-allow tourists to enter. Um, not sure in the middle of July that I'd be rushing to, Head off yeah, to Dubai yeah. for July for two weeks on the beach, um, forty-five degrees, um, and a bit of respite coming up with Eid. Um, so wishing all of our Muslim listeners, of course, um, you know, happy um, Eid al Adha. Um, yeah. But um, I would suggest that um, that this comes at great expense. Um, however, if you have access to the to the collateral, Chris, 
it's very clear that, that governments have got diff, you know, very different means of trying to use these levers and pulling different levers to see which one works best. So yep. Emirates you know, announced sort of some of their hygiene kits early on, the PPE kits early on, went out there with the customer videos and the social, the social media marketing. They further went onto that into, and then you know, sort of reopened transit, but then, then, the, um, then the Emirate of Dubai opened up itself and they provided testing in airports and there were some of the first out there with the, the testing capability. I think it takes it one step further and it'll be interesting to see what the response is and, and you know, Emirates stores are generally fairly buoyant um, you know, positive carrier reported lots of positive news. I think it's interesting to see in a couple of weeks' time, Sir Tim Clark's doing he's done a lot of webinars recently. He's been very kind of um, uh, conservative about the overall picture. I think Emirates is massively, obviously, handicapped by having an all wide body fleet. Yeah. yeah. Um, and their business was 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 you know uh, was massively O and D dependent. You know, through that transit hub. So I think um, this is helpful probably for those wanting to. To get back in the air, um, you know, I think government sponsored. Let, let's see what happens. So, you know, will it will it have a, a an exponential um, uh, or will it have an effect that, that sort of drives exponential re return to to normality? No, I don't think so personally. I think no, I think it's a I think I think it's an it's, it's another ingredient in the in the cake mixture to and help the it taste a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The choice, the choice differential, exactly. Now, another, another country, huge population and huge challenges, but also huge opportunities, and something we've been talking about lately, India. So we've got one now where SpiceJet being given the green light to operate flights to US and almost being the designated carrier. I mean, that's good, that's good news, huh? It's good news if we've got the fleet. I'm not sure they've got the fleet yet to operate it. Um, you know, I guess carriers, so just playing devil's advocate, carriers will often apply for traffic rights to to fly to lots of places. Um, Ryanair had traffic rights and were designated on, on London, Moscow many years ago, but they never took up the option. Um, they do it for all sorts of commercial and political reasons. So let's see what happens. SpiceJet, um, you, know, um, you know, sort of plays second fiddle in the domestic market to Indigo. Of course, Indigo um, you know, is, is, the, is, the, is the standout um, you know, uh, contender there for the sort of the, the, the excellence award. I think Indigo is, is, is run very, very well and has, a, has got, you know, a lot of scale and, uh, but therefore also has got a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of collateral, um, potential underwrite some of this, um, depending on their, on their ownership lease mix. So I'm not sure that SpiceJet will take that up anytime soon. I'm just saying plain, plain devil's advocate. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but of yeah. course, interesting, Chris, to see because um, the Air India situation is is pretty pretty fragile, I would I would suspect. I think the government of Air, of India will have uh, its own challenges, and when when taxpayers' money from the Ministry of Finance starts to run dry, you know, continuing to pump in money into a, a state-owned enterprise that arguably is is up for privatisation, you know, how many people are knocking on the door today to acquire Air India? They yeah. might be knocking on the door to acquire components or, or parts of, of Air India, but I'm not sure that the airline is one today that would that would be um, you know sort of first um, the first cab off the rank for an investor. So SpiceJet may be maybe interesting. I mean that that might that might um, eventually but let, let's watch this space. Yeah and also Vistara now focusing on on live flat business class seats which is uh, which is interesting. Uh. Well, look, the, the, I, I, again, I mean, India is a, India's a country uh, of, of massive proportions, um, both, both geographically and in population terms. It also is an, a, a significantly, um, a historically, previously growing, pretty fast uh, middle, middle class. And, um, you know, there are, there are a large number of very wealthy, um, uh, you know, Indian, Indian customers. Um, who may well may well fit that Vistara model. Um, I'm not sure, however, that the success of carriers like Indigo has been built on attracting the A's and B's of the socioeconomic uh, group. I think Indigo's success has been offering low fares because of its excellently uh, developed and, and, and disciplinedly, you know, sort of maintained run model, which, which drives its lowest unit costs and gets lowest fare to market. India has always been a very price sensitive game, Chris. I spent a lot of time working in India, as you know. I know, I know you, India, you know India quite well as well. And it's a market that I think is, is stack him high, sell him low. 
I yeah. think his um is uh, uh was it with Mr. Walmart or it might have been uh, I can't remember the fella's name, the Walmart fella. Wall what, what was the Walmart man? I'm Oof. sure some listener will come and tell us. They're coming, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it was all you know. It, it's a volume game. It's bums on seats. So, yeah. so I think let let let's see, let's see. I think the Tatars have got an interesting interesting juxtaposition there now. Of course, with Air Asia, India, and Vistara, um, Singapore Airlines, the Air Asia Group. You know, there's a lot going on within Air Asia. There's a lot a lot going on on in Singapore Airlines. Obviously, in terms of support from them from the shareholder to Massey and so on. So, India's got some. You know, I, I think an exciting exciting uh, prospect, but but an interesting dynamic set of dynamics right now. Yeah, yeah. No, hundred percent. Yeah, I think I, I, I'll have a word with Salem. I think we're going to get some uh, some guests from India on very shortly, and um, uh, colleague of our summit, I'm sure, is going to come up with some ideas. So we'll have a chat with him later. Now, Steve, Walmart founder, Mr. Sam Walton. Sam Walton, very yeah. good, very good. I used to watch the Waltons. I wonder which one he was. <laughs> good night, Sam. Um, <laughs> right now, another one. Cyber security and, and some of the security issues that have been in the press lately. And we've got a question here from Anne. Cyber security looks like entering further debate and concern. Do you think enough is being done in our industry, especially now with this crisis in mid flow? No, I think, no, look, can always, I mean, we're, we're never complacent, Chris. I, I don't think anybody should be complacent running any business um, when it comes to any topic. So um, this is an interesting one because, of course, there's been some pretty big breaches out there uh, of recent of recent um, times. The most recent one that I can recollect, and some of our listeners might know this more 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 uh, uh, or more recently than I do, but was EasyJet. Uh, I think in February they announced and the breach was 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 a little bit prior to then. Um, I only remember it vividly because I got an email specifically stating that 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 that, that, that data had been breached. And um, you know the response was pretty robust. Prior to that, we've seen British Airways, we've seen other carriers uh, in data breaches, and um, you know not just in aviation, but I think you know I, I don't think COVID changes our need to to maintain a strong handle uh, on cyber security, on data security. Of course, with G, uh, uh, GDPR regulations in place in Europe and for European businesses operating globally, um, that places a lot of uh, you know, emphasis on sharing and exchange of data, but also data security. Um, you know, data is worth a lot of people to, sorry, data is worth a lot of money to, to a few uh, people. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I remember the sort of the, the discussion about American health records. Um, you know, this, these, these were really valuable um, records because of course it, it, it influences premiums. I, I, you know, I, I don't think my travel records and my travel history is relevant to many people other than other than my wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 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 so, you know, but, but look back, serious note is, is I don't think it changed anything. Now, I think, I think what will happen is, again, because of, because of um, you know, uh, wanting to shore up customer yeah. confidence or yeah, sorry, yeah. shore up customer confidence, I think a lot of a lot of a lot of these these might be emphasised more. I, I suspect what what was happening before was very much below the line, and the expenditure was already there, and the business was already doing the right thing. I think what might happen is it might become a bit more overt um, uh, and um, and above the line sort of you know, yeah. propagation of what uh, airlines are doing. Yeah, I think that's what Anne was Anne was referring to. There was a couple of other other sentences there about the fact that you know people people weren't so sure of of what was and was not. A manageable risk which is why she was referring to covid and uh, you know the yeah. emphasis now is that you might think that you're well enough protected but you need to really get involved and check because uh, the last thing you need now is a breach on that level again yeah. coming back to confidence so very good now steve Qantas. we were talking about Qantas earlier and about the uh, the poor old queen of the skies retiring one year short of 50 years Queen of the Skies, we are in service with Connors, I think, since 1971. So next year, 2021, would have been her 50th anniversary at Qantas. Um, as you know, Chris, I've spent a num large number of years working for the Qantas group and working with them as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a client of Skylight Aviation. And so Qantas is very dear to my heart, as was the 747, especially yep. the 744s in the Qantas fleet that I, you know, at one stage, I was commuting every four weeks between Australia and the UK. Um, and um, in my early days, in I'd say living, living and working in Australia, I was 
commuting back to the UK and it was on the Queen of the Skies. And, and actually, I, um, I mean, when the 380 product was, was, was launched, it was a fantastic product. I mean, it, 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 was, it, it beat the 744 hands down. But there's just something nice about being on that aircraft. So I was sad to see that fly off this week um, over to the States uh, from Sydney. They did an amazing, um, an amazing uh, bit of, um, of flying to, to track the aircraft with a Qantas logo. Just, um, just off um, the eastern seaboard in Australia, which if you look it up on flight radar, you'll see it. Um, it was, it was a superb piece of work. Uh, the flight number for those that want to look it up of interest was the, it was the QF um, 7474 or Qual Quebec Alpha Lima 7474, and you can see the excellent bit of flying that was done, um, obviously via coordinates on the eastern seaboard in Australia in the Pacific. It was beautiful. With a yeah, kangaroo, you, need, kangaroo you know logo. what you need to do, Steve. You need to get in touch with them and see if you can buy the seat that you sat in most often. It was an expensive seat at the time, but I, I, I was lucky. I, I was I was lucky. I was on duty travel, Chris. Yeah, but imagine now you could pay you could pay you could pay for that now and have that in your office. I could. Yeah, I wouldn't tell you what my favourite seat was. I know, I know, but I've got a fair idea. <laughs> yeah, got an A in it. Um, right <laughs> now, moving on again. Now another, another a, a country that I love, lived in, worked in uh, Portugal. And unfortunately, poor old Portugal still, you know, still, still being given a rough time, which I do not understand at all. I, I, I mean, I think there was some tense discussions this week um, yeah. uh, between the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the United Kingdom and the Portuguese government. And um, uh, I, I just can't I understand this. I mean, you know, Spain remains on the, on the, on the green list, yet has seen, has seen an increasing penetration or, or you know, number of cases in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And yet Portugal still has not made the cut. And I, I can't fathom this out. Um, the, the select committee has asked for the, for the selection criteria, i.e. What, what does one have to do to make it onto that list? And the, and the government have refused to publish and share. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure what this is all about. Um, it's interesting, as I, told, as I told listeners, I think three weeks ago, the oldest alliance in the world yeah. between any, any two countries is the Windsor, the Windsor Agreement that was, that was, that was I think... Um, uh, I think I said it was the 15th century or something around there. It might yep. be the 12th century, I can't recollect, uh, between Portugal and England. So, you know, our history goes back a long, long way. This is, this is bizarre to me. Yeah, and living very close to Windsor and the Magna Carta, I have there used that several times, Stephen. The Windsor it was for, it went to 14th century, Chris. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Very good, mm. mate. I'm very impressed. As always, that poor little collie's got a lot to live up to. <laughs> She's, try, she's, she's trying to um, bite through my wife's laptop bag, which is at my feet. So I'm not really sure that's going to end up well for either me or the dog. <laughs> because it'll be my fault can, regardless. Yeah, but at least you can blame the dog. Stephen, now, now the last final question, Rashid. Why don't you both create an audit tool to be used that teaches both auditors and leaders how to welcome audit checks and learn from it and be positive about them? Now, I'm, I'm not sure, sure that's because we've been uh, we've been preaching so much about the fact that there's far too many people in this industry, from IOSA all the way down, I say go everywhere, where a the auditors aren't the best, b the objectives are just get no findings and get out there as quick as you can, yeah. Yeah. and c yeah. it's almost like a flipboard chart where people go around and say, look, you know, here you go, if you can clear this up before we go, everything's fine, happy happy days, and away you go. exactly. And it's a complete and utter waste. And in a time now where everybody is focusing on, on costs, cash flow, etc., it's a waste of money. But why not do the damn thing properly and, and start getting people to realise that perhaps if so many things had been done properly a lot earlier, there'd been an awful lot less waste at the end of certain budget years and budget, budget plans. Uh, Chris, I mean, it's not that I, I think. Look, Rashid, you ask a very interesting question. One that one that one that I can't answer um, as to the why. Um, what we can answer, I suspect, is the how, um, because the reality is that that businesses have always had this degree of suspicion of an auditor, whether it's a financial auditor, or it's really? an operational quality safety auditor, or it's a it's an internal auditor. Um, you know, there's even there's even you know more degree of 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 caution exercise when it's an external auditor. So, I think um, 
you know, I think a lot of the, the good practice goes back to financial audits, what we said before, Chris. Financial audits typically are conducted properly, they're conducted well, they're done from a regulatory perspective. And if you don't have, you know, if you're a large corporate business and you don't have signed off accounts, very difficult to get investment, shareholding, you know, yep. uh, you know, so, so I think there is just cause for that. I think, I think those businesses apply the same uh, um, degree of importance to operational and safety audits. Um, I think the ones where you've got, you know, you've got private businesses that maybe are, you know, sort of, you know, privately share, private shareholders um, and have been in family ownership or, or small, smaller groups. Those are the ones typically that want to get a, a certificate on the wall because yeah. they want to demonstrate to the big boys, the potential customer base that we're doing this right. Actually, all it demonstrates is that you're a fraud. Uh, and I, I don't use that word lightly. Yeah. You know, you are kidding yourself. You're wasting your own money. And ultimately, the airlines and the future customers will find out. And therefore, what you do is you're building yourself into spiral descent. And you're trying to continue to, 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 to cover up this kind of, this, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, in the reality, I guess, if you like. And, you know, rather than using it as an opportunity to improve, you, you use it as, a, as an opportunity to, you know, hide things or do a tidy up the week before. That's what we normally see. So Rashid, I'd like to take you up on your on your on your um, your suggestion that that Chris and I might be able to help. I'm not sure that it, it, it you know there are there are there, there's a number of ways to tackle this. I I, I suspect um, I'm not sure that there's one size fits all, Chris. And I think I think it needs a whole of industry approach. I would say that coming out of COVID, you know, post COVID world, it will be helpful for us to consider the implications of maybe some sort of peer pressure or sort of, you know, collaboration across the peers. There's nothing to be ashamed about, about having findings. In fact, there's everything to be ashamed about not having findings. So that's the dial we're going to turn. I think we should, but I'm being serious now, Steve, we should have a look at this. Because what we should do is we should do a reboot readiness review. Yeah. And, and, I think, we look, should, and anybody, who wants, anybody who wants to have a go, then we'll, 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 uh, we'll do it with them. Absolutely. We entirely support that. And also the way, the way and the manner in which it's delivered. And, and uh, it should be, I think when you do them, you should be teaching people, not telling people. Exactly. exactly. This know? is about coaching, coaching and yeah. mentoring and advising. Yeah. 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 Oh, so good. We'll have a go at that. Now, another little issue is passenger refunds. And there was an interesting piece of news about Finnair paying 270 million euros in passenger refunds. And the general... The general picture now of you know carriers putting schedules up, and then obviously people trying to sell the seats, and then suddenly the schedules get cancelled, and there's all differences. That's not a good. That's not a good way to instill confidence. Well, it's not, Chris. But do, but do you blame them? I don't blame. I don't blame anybody. What the the, the the question I'm I'm pitching to you is how can people do something in a little bit more of a controlled and sustainable fashion. Well, so that people don't get so disrupted and disappointed. And well, the first thing, the first thing we should do is have a moratorium on two six one regulation. That yep. should be immediately applied. So two six one should be thrown out the window. Uh, and I, I don't say that lightly. I, I say that with with complete regard for ensuring that the customers are respected, looked after, and get what they pay for. And if they don't get what they pay for, they should be refunded. But there Correct. should be no need for the airline community and the airlines who are who you know, are out there trying to recover from the, the most disruptive event in their entire existence that's massively stressed cash flows, that are trying to get business back. Then the government pulls the carpet from underneath their feet and things don't open up as planned. And so they've got to cancel flying. Not only have they got to do a refund, if it's canceled within seven days, then they've got to find compensation for the customer and get them to the final destination. Well, that, yeah. my friend, is utter you, yeah. rubbish. Yeah. And I was hesitant to use another word there but i would have done but this is a really important so customers have to recognize you in choosing to fly in the next six months i suspect are taking a bit of a punt it's yep. like it's like putting a bet on the 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 quarter past three at um at uh, at ascot um and uh, you know it, it, your horse might come home it might not even run might not start yep. well look that that's the name of the game however if you get your flight and you fly and it travel and you and you're happy to go look this will be a bit of a gamble for people it's going to be akin to a bit of taking a punt now if you're seeing holidays on british airways advertised for 200 quid as i've seen 
for seven days right now in a five-star hotel in in uh, in Italy in Olga in Sardinia or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the flight doesn't happen in a month's time. Don't be too upset because Italy has a spike again, and you can't fly. I one wouldn't be expecting to travel. I want. I secondly have to accept the British might be trying to refund my booking. And thirdly, I wouldn't be going running off to the EU asking for compensation from the airline when they don't give it to me. Very well said. Very well said. But that, and I agree with it. There should be a gap. In, there should be a gap in the in the legislation now. And also the, coming back to what we spoke about earlier, Emirates with the insurance. That's another reason why you would make a certain choice. Exactly. And look, price elasticity does not allow us. And it does not. Everybody says, well, just put a levy on the fare. Just charge up an extra 10 euros or 20 euros for each and two one levy. It doesn't work like that. The elasticity yeah. in the pricing and demand doesn't allow that to happen. So when you're looking at airlines offering these low fares to stimulate demand, the, the, you know, 261, 261 was already killing airlines. You know, you've seen in British Airways accounts or IEG's groups, I think it was less, it's like 200 million quid last year alone on 261 compensation. When yeah. customers pay 50 quid and they get 600 euros. Yeah. Or, yeah. Three, or 300 euros, sorry, short of life. That, that just doesn't work. No, where, where else would that happen? Yeah, yeah. But that's exactly, but that's another, that's another issue now about, about certain rules and whether they're still applicable and whether they make sense. Common sense isn't common. Indeed, indeed. Customers need to be reasonable as well. Yeah, they do indeed. Stephen, I feel it's been a very energetic show this week. <laughs> this week. Not sure if that's, if that's as, a, uh, as a result of the arrival of a new member of the family. But, um, she's, bite, she's biting on my toe, which, which is, if, you, if, if our viewers, so for those viewing, um, see me keep looking down through my glass top desk, it's because this little type is biting my foot and I'm trying to prevent her from doing so without disturbing the show. I hope I made a good job of it. Nobody noticed. I would have no, got no, away you, with that if I, ne no, if I no, never you, mentioned anything, I'm sure. You did well. And I'm thinking that the, the passion that you showed at times there is either because she really got through the sock or the shoe and did bite the toe, or it's just nice to see that passion come out. Always, Steve. Ba bare, barefoot here in Malaysia, Chris. Yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. Listen. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks a lovely, lot. Lovely, lovely to see week. you again. Yep. Look forward to seeing you next week. And please, God, there'll be a lot more positives. And again, just for everybody, the reason rules are in place is to make everybody safer. Follow the rules or don't play. And wishing all of our Muslim friends a very happy um, Eid Mubarak yep. and Eid al-Adha this week. Yeah, thir Thursday, I think, starts, isn't it? That's right. Indeed. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All the best. Take care to everybody. Bye now. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.